few years now and been to other events and to see it turn into this is absolutely incredible and it really is the work of one person and um, TJ's first for, talk we were at Chelsea Piers and we had a, a plate of uh, red peppers and uh, yeah, TJ's been with me since the beginning I really appreciate it thanks <laughs> You come for the red peppers, stay, stay for Catherine. Um, I, my name is TJ Quinn. I'm a reporter at ESPN. Uh, I've been there about eight years. I cannot tell you how pleased I am to be up here with these people, some of whom are friends of mine. All of them are people I admire a great deal. Um, we're going to try to keep this moving. It's scheduled. It's been a long day for a lot of you. For some of you, the alcohol is just kicking in. Uh, that might make it more pleasant. We'll plan to go for a while. Uh, if you decide you've had enough, feel free. You may leave the room. No one, is, no one has to get anything signed. Um, but we'll, after good maybe 15, 20 minutes, like to open it up for questions and encourage you to, to please ask them. Um, this is a very engaged group that you've gotten in front of you right now. Uh, so I'm going to let them introduce themselves. A point again, we are, in case you we're not paying attention to it. We are all members of the media, um, different backgrounds, but all uh, have, have dealt with this issue one way or another. And for the most part, what we're going to talk about is the role of the, of the media in identifying this issue and in, in advancing the public conversation. What's our role? What should we be doing? What shouldn't we be doing? And because you are hopefully the people who are consuming what we put out there, it is vital you become part of this conversation. I strongly encourage it. Uh, so without further ado, I'll ask my colleagues each to just quickly introduce themselves and, and where they work. Bonnie. I'm uh, Bonnie Ford. I work at ESPN in the Enterprise and Investigations Group. I have a long background in newspapers before that, and I've been at ESPN for about 10 years. I am Patrick Ruby. I am a contributing editor at Vice Sports and uh, also have a long background, which includes a stint at ESPN with these lovely people. I'm Stanley Kay. I work at Sports Illustrated. I've been there for about a couple years, and I'm the token millennial on the panel, I guess. <laughs> uh, I'm Tom McLeod. Uh, I've come here from London. I work for Sky Sports and Sky e semi-professionally until I was in my late teens, so that's what got me interested. Uh, I'm Peter Keating. I have not played rugby semi-professionally. Um, I'm a writer at ESPN the magazine uh, where I've covered concussions, including concussions in female athletes for a long time. I'm Stefan Fatsis. I am a freelance writer here in Washington. I'm an author. I worked for the Wall Street Journal for many years. I write for Slate and I'm a panelist <coughs> on a Slate podcast called Hang Up and Listen. I've talked about concussions a lot and uh, written a bunch about concussions in youth sports. And you've heard that voice on NPR fairly often, as one case. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> and uh, I am Tim Bella, and I am a features writer at Al Jazeera America for another five weeks or so. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> moment of silence for Tim. Sorry. Uh, <clears throat> as we were, we were all chatting about this early on, and trying to think, what's the better comparison when you look at the media and concussions? Is it climate change? Is it smoking? Um, the point was, at some point, the world looked at it one way, and we are now at an after moment. There was a before and after, someplace along the line. Peter, you've been at this about as long as anybody I know. Uh, what is your thought on how well, this is going to be a loaded question, how well did we as an industry start to recognize what was starting to, to come out and anecdotally and scientifically? If you look back at uh, how concussions were treated in popular culture, say a generation ago, I did a story on Joe Namath recently, and Joe Namath was on the Dean Martin celebrity roast in the late 70s. And Charlie Callis, an old comedian, came out with a football jersey on, walking around with making goo-goo noises and with his eyes crossed and talked about how he had been hit in the head with an old teammate of Joe Namath's, and the crowd roared. People laughed. It was, it, was, it was humorous that this guy was pretending to be socked in the head so many times that he didn't know where he was. Um, it took a while for people to take anywhere, and people anywhere to take seriously the idea that guys who went into a profession where they were going to get hit in the head deserved some respect when it came to figuring out um, whether they were suffering brain trauma. I think that once the world kind of caught on to that um, through so many people being injured, 
largely high-profile quarterbacks in the 90s and their agents, Troy Aikman and Steve Young and Lee Steinberg. I think the media didn't do a bad job, but it took a long time because the NFL actively obstructed the investigation of this subject. And the NFL is the biggest, most powerful, most popular sport in the country. As it goes, go so many youth sports. As it goes, so many of the fans and analysts and commentators. And it took a while to figure out that they were pursuing science designed to fail for more than a dozen years. Um, once that story got unlocked by us, by the New York Times, by other people, with the help of Chris Nowinski, who's right there, um, I, think, I think it took off. Um, so it took a while, but once, once the, the blockade was surmounted, um, I think it was, a, it was a job handled pretty well. Stephen. Well, I, th I think part of the, the, the blockade in the beginning is, was a lack of awareness in the media, that nobody was pointing reporters at prominent publications like The Times, like ESPN, like The Wall Street Journal, um, to actively say there's a cover-up going on. The science is bad. The NFL is promulgating data and information and papers that don't stand up to scrutiny. Um, and, and I think that, and I, look, I was, I'm, I'm as guilty as anybody. I was at the Wall Street Journal from 1995 to 2006, and this really didn't cross my radar. This did not become an issue that I felt compelled to, to write about. Um, and I think that the dam started to break with Alan Schwartz at the New York Times mm -hmm. and a persistent effort to cover this as a beat. To, 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 un, to tug at the thread of the broader narrative and have it come out piece by piece by piece. But it took a long time, as Peter said. Well, I think it's crucial to also point out, we're all aware, maybe not everyone else is necessarily, that when you say the media, the number of jobs you're describing uh, is countless. You've got people who do features, broader things, but you've got the ones who are day-to-day -day with the NFL, with FIFA, with, with any sport, it's a much different relationship. Patrick, as somebody who's been outside of it, describe for people what it's like to piss off the NFL. Uh, <laughs> well, let's just say I won't be getting any Christmas cards from Roger Goodell. Um, it is, you know, here's the thing. So, like, we're in Washington, right? So you look at the way Capitol Hill or the White House is covered, and you've kind of got access journalism, and you have adversarial journalism. And you sort of need both, right? Access journalists, they have to cultivate sources. They have to sort of tell you the inside TikTok of what's happening. And you've got adversarial journalists who are oftentimes coming from the outside, not as worried necessarily about burning relationships, but they're holding power accountable. And they're trying to call out BS, essentially, like what we've talked about, some of this sort of bogus science that was gone, this cooking that was going on. Um, I think that that's, you know, in terms of what the media can do, how we can sort of cover this, we sort of need both. We need still some access journalism to get a feel for what is being said and thought in these sort of like offices that are you know, in the NFL, in the, in the NHL, wherever it is that are sort of locked away from us. But we also need people to take a step back, be watchdogs and say, wait a second, there's something going on here. Or maybe there's still something going on here, much like we've seen with uh, Coca-Cola and the coverage of science around sugar intake that we've seen some stuff in your times about, what you see with, you mentioned climate change, what you see the energy industry trying to do uh, in terms of what is global warming. Is it really a problem? Do we really know if it's man-made? I mean, there's a lot of stuff where science is always inconclusive and it's always working towards better information, more research. My parents are research scientists, I understand this. But there is also sort of a level of, okay, given what we do know now, what can we say? What can we say with relative certainty? How should we act? How should we act in terms of public policy? And I think the media can fill a really important job of pushing that conversation forward. And again, sort of acting as the fourth estate, like acting as a pushback against corporate interests, against lawyers, against you know, people who are involved in litigation that are trying to shape this issue a certain way. Um, and also, one more thing, you mentioned this too, you know, we're all journalists. We're not necessarily scientific experts, although we kind of become fake experts on a lot of things over time. But we rely on all of you. We rely on our sources. We rely on trustworthy people. We rely on people who are out there, who are working in science, who see something fishy that's going on, who see a study published that, wait a second, that's not quite right, who know of a story that's very powerful that needs to be told. You know, we try and seek you out. We try to build a relationship with you. But we're also very receptive, you know, if you see something that's wrong, if you see something, say something. That doesn't just work, you know, on the subway with a shady bag. It works in our business as well. Right. 
Tim, uh, someone who I first met when he was a grad student. Uh, that is a tough thing for all of us, with the exception of David Epstein, who's not here. Most of us don't have a science background. How do you feel our business has done, in a general mainstream sense, about starting to grasp the science and the implications of it? I think it's really important over the past couple years People on this stage and elsewhere have have a ton of better and better job digging into what you actually know and separating that from what you do know. And I know at least on my end, what what you do do very well is the anecdotal. And in terms of of what a female athlete goes through or a male athlete goes through, I know at least on my end, I have had the uh, honor of meeting with and interviewing a large number of former female athletes who who have been going to tell their stories of very raw stories in a real fashion and I think with each story that does come out there's a little more pressure and a little more pressure and a little more pressure to to help push the science forward and and make a collective call to actually push that science forward. So I, I think it has improved TJ, but it, I also think there is um, a ways to actually go still. And you see, yeah, please. So just following on from that, one of the things I was saying earlier is, and it relates into how we as journalists get information out there. You know, I've sat through a lot of today and, you know, as many people up here, I have no scientific background whatsoever. And obviously, I, there's a vague level I understand it on, and it's accessible to me. But as researchers, I think the dissemination of information to us needs to be better. And we need, you know, it works both ways. We need to engage with, with the medical community to learn more about, at the level that we need to deliver it to the public, to parents, and to children. How do we understand this? Is it, is it right? Is it totally agreed upon within the scientific community? And I certainly sometimes struggle knowing what to believe and then how to translate that to someone who is going to have no idea what it means at the level that the people we've seen today are. And it's, it's a really tough thing to do, isn't it, to try and explain in layman's terms it's such a complex subject. But I think it's something that is getting better. It's getting better, but for me, the, the research, you know, you do put all that stuff today, you put it out there, does it end there? You know, we've presented this research and now we're going to go away and we'll do some more and we'll be back in a couple of years. Like you said, Patrick, it almost needs to be, here's the research we've done, I'm going to send this out to this little roster of journalists that we have and explain it, top line it with, here's what I've found, do you want to write something about it? It works both ways, we should have those relationships with you. But to get it out there, I think that relationship between us and the medical community needs to be far better and far more understandable. We've also seen, I mean, we talked both about the models of smoking and about climate change. The science on both is settled, uh, fairly settled. Uh, and yet, not all people are convinced of either climate change. And I still see a few smokers uh, when you walk outside. Information apparently is not always enough. Uh, the question then becomes, what is our role once you've put that information out there? Is it simply enough as a journalist or as a, as a media outlet to say this is what the science says, now go forth and make a decision? Or is there some point where we need to become advocates, where you need to take a stronger measure? Uh, Stanley, I want to start with you on that. As someone who's spent a, a larger, not to pick on you, um, but a larger percentage of your life has been in this sort of age of, a, of almost enlightenment. Um, I, I want you to start in on that, please. That sounds like a compliment, first of all, not That's picking right. on me. Um, I, I, I think the climate change comparison is very appropriate. Um, we've reached the point now where, where the science, as you said, is this link between brain damage and a lot of these sports, football in particular, is settled. Uh, there's still uncertainty about the extent of it, of course, um, but the science there is settled. But now you have the NFL and similar organizations, they're acknowledging that this is an issue. Um, but what's obscured is sort of what the, 
what certain organizations are doing about it or uh, the, the general science there. So I, th I think what one thing that we can do as the press is to hold these sort of organizations accountable. Um, and it's not just putting out the information that, hey, football, hey, soccer is, uh, you know, could be dangerous, could lead to these, could lead to concussions, could lead to post-concussion syndrome, CTE, et cetera. But it's also about looking at the leagues and saying, hey, it's what they're doing is heads up tackling, um, for example, to reference the NFL's initiative. Um, is that working? Is that something that's actually a solution? That's something that we can uh, look at as a group and as the media um, as a whole and, and really question that. And maybe it is working, maybe it's not, maybe you know, it needs to be tweaked, but we need to hold organizations like the NFL, like FIFA, accountable um, and you know, see if their initiatives and they're acknowledging the science, what are they doing about it? That's the next step in my opinion. Bonnie. Well, I was just going to say, as someone who's covered big four professional sports and also a lot of Olympic sports over the last 20, uh, 25 years, uh, it's really just crossed my transom that a lot of times the authorities, with no disrespect towards any specialty that we're listening to on teams, team physicians, are often not specialists in concussion. This is probably not news to you guys, okay? But most team doctors in our realm are orthopedes, right? Uh, and sort of asking that question of, do you have someone on your staff with experience in neurological issues, in neck injuries, in nerve damage from these injuries, and not just accept that because somebody has, again, with all due respect, DR or MD in their title, that they necessarily know what they're talking about. I think we need to challenge those norms a lot more. If I could follow on, I mean, one of the things I've learned in covering this subject is there is there is sometimes a bit of uh, people driving a little bit outside of their area of expertise lane, so to speak. I mean, as journalists, we all do that, I guess, to some extent, that's our job. Um, like I said, we're all fake experts on everything. But I mean, but, 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 in, but in seriousness, I mean, sometimes, you know, I'll be talking to an athletic trainer who's acting or speaking with the confidence that they are a neuropsychologist. And then I'm talking to a neuropsychologist who is speaking as if they're a neuropathologist who has been dissecting brains, you know, in a lab. And, I find the best information definitely comes from identifying people who sort of stay in their lane and know it really well. Um, the other thing I would say in terms of what we can do to follow on your point, Stanley, uh, is the old journalism saw, follow the money. That's still really important for us in terms of performing that watchdog accountability role. Um, like for instance, right now, there is a lot of funding or there's a good amount of funding for this field that comes from industries that could have their bottom line damaged by what the scientific findings end up being. So we, at the very least, as journalists, it's our job to investigate that, look at that closely, make the public aware of that, that there could be conflicts of interest. That's not to say that every single scientist that takes money from industry is going to do like cooked work. That's not to say it at all. But to say that that's something that's important to be aware of. Also, like I said earlier, you know, we also rely on all of you to come to us for your own funding what we do in terms of driving public conversation, driving public awareness, that absolutely has a huge effect on public policy, which does affect funding in the long run. That affects priorities. That affects what politicians think are important. Those politicians go to the NIH and tell them, we want you to fund this or we don't want you to fund this. So that really matters too. And that's something I think all of you should think about. Stephanie. Uh, to, follow, to follow up on the league stuff, I mean, yes, I mean, I think that's a basic point that I think the public understands a lot better now that, mm -hmm. and athletes understand a lot better now that just because the doctor says, the team physician says, do this or do that, that they're not an expert. I, I spent a summer inside an NFL team as a fake kicker and wrote a book about life in the NFL um, for the Denver Broncos. And the players, you know, the players have an obliviousness to it. I mean, what the physician tells you to do is what you do. But there is far greater awareness now that they should not trust. There's still the, the, the latent fear that I'll lose my job if I speak out or if I seek a second opinion. But I think we're, we're almost beyond that conversation. And part of the reason that athletes are more empowered is because stories have been written. Um, when, I, when I wrote my book about the Broncos, this was 10, 10 summers ago, it was 2006, there was very little conversation about the effect of brain injury, the effect of uh, multiple subconcussive blows, about being a lineman. The, the most affecting conversation I had in an interview that I did that summer was with an interior lineman, an offensive lineman, who told me, I just don't think about it. I don't talk about it with my wife. 
we know it exists. And this was sort of at the cusp of the, the media beginning to become aware and to push stories out about this. Um, but I think that conversation has changed dramatically in the last 10 years. More athletes are having this conversation. They are aware, they are aware of the consequences and they are aware that they need to seek help and that's because of the media. So I think when it comes to what the media should do, it is holding leagues accountable because it can be effective. Uh, two years ago, I did a series of stories about uh, Abby Wambach, the professional soccer player who was playing here in Washington, who I was at a game with my, at the time, 10-year-old daughter, and we watched her get drilled in the head from about 10 feet away and watched the referee refuse to take, let her out of the game, to take her out of the game, watched her coach not remove her from the game, and watched as the game ended, the goalkeeper on the team frantically calling for the training staff to come on the field. She never acknowledged that she had a concussion. The team never acknowledged that she had a concussion. And it took f a month of my writing stories until the league acknowledged, the league agreed to change its policies, the league agreed to inform referees about what they had to do. So yes, it is possible to affect change inside these organizations. I think the smaller the organization is, the more likely you are to have an effect. But look, the NFL has made changes too, probably not as many as most of us would agree. Um, are necessary, but it's possible to affect. Um, I would just like to say we're talking at this level so far where um, athletic trainers in this country on professional sports teams, and it has got better. There's money there. For me, the biggest issue is what someone actually brought up earlier today in research, is how you get the stuff that you guys are talking to down to when children and amateurs first go into their, their, doc, their GP, is what we call it in the UK. You know, that is that that's the area where I don't think there's been great progress. You know, you can have an athletic trainer and an NFL team who have millions, if not billions of dollars across the whole league. And you can say awareness has gone up. Is the awareness filtering down to someone who walks into their family doctor and says, oh, you know, little Johnny here has he got knocked out a couple of times at the weekend. Are we getting, is that expertise there? In my opinion, in, in, in the UK, I, I don't actually think it is. Well, that's, I, I want to say a perfect, thank you for the setup. Because um, <laughs> I wanted to say, we, didn't, we did not want to stay in the NFL the whole time. That really is what brought it to the, to the national conversation, international conversation, Tom. And, uh, but uh, I, I'm thinking back to my days uh, as an amateur boxer in the 80s and 90s, and you'd get all the literature that would constantly remind you that studies showed amateur boxing was safer than soccer because we all knew how safe the sport soccer was. Therefore, if we were safer than that, our brains were okay. Uh, we've learned a little more about soccer since then. Uh, we, we're not just talking fighting against major institutions and, and with billions of dollars behind them, but against social institutions, ways that we have looked at, the game, at these games for generations as to what they are. Peter, how significant you know, has the shift been beyond football where we know it's, a, it's a, as they say, a collision sport, not a contact sport. Where you can watch for two minutes and get the point of that. Um, how tough has it been to, to start to recognize how significant the problem is beyond that sport? Well, in one aspect, it's hard because as news organizations, everyone wants to chase the leading edge of a story. And so if there's a new antibody or a new test or a new treatment or a new scandal at the, the frontier, of concussion science. That makes news, and it's what we're all trying to get stories on and write about. Meanwhile, there are literally millions and millions of families whose first exposure to this story came when the movie Concussion came out, or when somebody in their family got hurt over you know, Thanksgiving, playing football, or falling off a balance beam. And it's hard to figure out how to keep writing stories that introduce the population of folks who are just new to this to the story for the first time, because you're chasing the other edge of the story, the leading edge of the story, for years. Um, but I think with women's sports, participation rates are so high that there's a demand for more information. And there's just this recognition that's growing among people who participate in, and especially if your kids participate in women's sports, that there are um, inequities out there about assumptions that you can give the same test to boys and girls, uh, assumptions that return to play is the same or should be the same, assumptions that uh, uh, males and females will report their symptoms or talk to doctors or, have, or even have the same symptoms in the same way. Nobody, nobody, you know, none of that's actually true, but it's been assumed to be true for so long that once the effects of it not being true get felt among families, people start asking for information. So I actually think that the, there's a hunger out there right now 
for information on women's sports, um, maybe even more than some of the male sports that are non-contact related. I think it actually has mapped exactly. into women's sports more naturally. Yeah, right. Bonnie, you, as my daughter once described her, one of the arguably best female <sighs> women's tough. soccer writers uh, this, this country has seen. You've spent a great deal of time with that, with Olympic sports. What have you seen about how well they're starting to look at this? Well, I've seen protocols that are just horribly behind. And when you, you're probably familiar with soccer and substitutions and the controversy about, you know, should we have longer evaluation on the sidelines? Well, let's talk about a sport like cycling, where if you're in the middle of a stage race, a week long or a 10 day race, and you crash at the side of the road, your evaluation, excuse me, is frequently uh, holding on to the team doctor's or the race doctor's car, rolling, okay, and being evaluated that way or by the side of the road, knowing that if you go out, your team can't put another person in that race. Uh, I've also had some discussions recently about figure skating, where the vast majority of concussions come in training sessions, where you and your coach are probably the only people on the ice. There's not a trainer, there's not a neurologist sitting in, in the rink ready to say whether you should continue to practice your triple axle. So one thing that really resonated with me to, uh, up on the athletes panel, thank you very much, it was just a wonderful panel, is that we really are only into the second or maybe third generation of women really playing contact sports. And believe me, uh, they are tough, tough people who have been raised on good coaching, raised to be aggressive, raised to be competitive, and therefore are going to be just as dishonest about their symptoms as the guys. I think more so. And, and uh, something that I've been grappling with recently uh, is how ethically do you approach the anecdotal story, which is clearly the best way to reach a wider audience, when often that athlete who's injured is the worst person to tell their story. You know, for months or years sometimes, they're either not competent to tell it, or they're still in, a, in limbo uh, treatment-wise, or they don't want to admit it. They're not sure their career is going to continue. So that's a real challenge. And I've posed that question to several athletes recently, including Brianna. Uh, when would you have been competent to tell your own story? And she thought about it for a few minutes. And it, she said, really, it would have been three or four years in. So that's the, we don't want to hear that. We want to be able to write a story. An active, a prominent player is out of the game. We want to write about what's happening to them. So there's a real conflict there. I don't have an answer for it. Tim, please. Yeah, it's kind of adding on there. I, I know at least in my work in speaking with former women college athletes who have had to step away from their sport, um, it, it has either taken them years before he actually spoke about it again, or it's the f first time. And I always ask them why. And there's just this sense of fear that they won't get heard. And I, I think it just kind of brings up a much larger point, and is that these women college athletes, um, specifically, they don't have the same kind of platform that, say, a football player would actually get. I mean, it doesn't matter if, if they're in equestrian or field hockey. It just doesn't matter. They, they keep telling them over and over again. I you know when I talk to the casual fan about what I went through, they're shocked because I was an equestrian rider or I played women's soccer. And water polo. Or water polo, exactly. I mean, and it, that has always been one of the most just kind of jarring parts about uh, about the whole landscape there. And I think the overall actual coverage is improving. But um, the, yeah, it, it's all about just kind of giving them a voice moving forward. Unfortunately, we're we're about out of time because uh, unfortunately the staff actually has to go home. Um, we.
four hours. You guys are all amazing. We easily get, so. Thank you. Um, by the way, Ruka, I, I do want to give us a few minutes for questions, and I hope you have some because um, you, you look engaged. Um, <laughs> uh, I want to point out, so I want to embarrass somebody here. Uh, there's a gentleman back there named Matt Cheney, who is a journalist in Missouri, who probably has had... I, I'm, I'm not overstating this, and not just because we're probably both going to have sons at University of Missouri, um, <laughs> but mine's done. yours is done and mine's about to start. Um, but Matt has probably done more to influence how this issue is covered than almost any other journalist out there. And he's not someone you've heard of because most of the work he does is independent. He's written a terrific book called Spiral of Denial, Denial which deals much more with, with uh, doping in football. He was a college football player himself. But the amount of research he has done and the relentlessness with which he has sent that information to other journalists, many of us are on his email list, uh, and he was someone who was able to just call BS on a lot of the, the pseudoscience that was going on uh, and to reach conclusions that people were not willing to make yet about what the dangers were of, of TBI. Uh, and it's, he deserves recognition for it because he's had a tremendous impact. So Matt, sorry sucker, you walked in the room. It's, you, you, you know, but he's been, he truly has. Um, he can be a complete pain in the ass to have as a guest when you're hosting a show, but that's okay. It's good, it's good TV. Um, thank you. Yes, a few times. Um, <laughs> yes, that's right. Uh, questions, please, for any and all of us. Uh, those, please. So I know that. Wow. Right in the face. <laughs> uh, so I know that frequently from the scientific community at meetings like this, things happen where it's said um, the media is in front of the science or uh, the, the media is sensationalist. And I feel like now is the opportunity to hear your side of the story and hear uh, your reaction to those comments and sort of what you guys would have to say um, in response. I'm not saying that's my opinion. I'm just saying those types of things are said. Well, where we're ahead of the science is we're generally more on top of corruption within organizations or you know, obscuring the issues on the part of organizations that have a vested interest in not being honest about the science. I wish I was ahead of the science. Then I'd, I'd be, you know, I'd have a, a different job title. Well, I, 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 Peter, please. I to say that I don't often hear scientists say we're ahead of the science. I often hear national organizations who have to deal with the fact that once it became a story that a star or a local or hometown or favorite player had a concussion, then all of a sudden there were 300 new news outlets around the country, each covering their own hometown star. And I think that gets on the nerves of national federations and organizations who then say, well, there were no stories at all six years ago, and now there's 350 stories. Well, I'm sorry, but 350 newspapers around the country realized that a guy from their hometown or a woman from their hometown had a problem. So I actually, you know, I don't hear that a lot from scientists. I hear it a lot from people who work for organizations who are aggrieved by news coverage. Or I think just people in the public that want to not think about change. And, you know, I've, Jerry Joya was here. We were on a, on a local uh, NPR show a, a year or two ago. And I do feel like, you know, in some ways the science community takes a scientific approach. Yes, we need more research. Yes, we shouldn't leap to too many conclusions. Yes, we, we, we don't want to install too many prohibitive actions on young athletes, on girls. Um, and then there are people in other communities that say, we don't want to discourage girls from playing sports by scaring them away. And I think the media's job is to say, well, let's be, you know, maybe we are not experts in the science, but we have some common sense. So we also have the ability to say, hey, you know, maybe there's no real athletic need for a 12-year-old girl to be taught how to head a soccer ball. Um, that there's no, that we can adapt our rules to just be safe without being, you know, overreactive. And, and I think that, so there is a push there. So if, if you know, if I come out and say, I, I, don't think, I don't think kids should be heading a soccer ball, I think it's stupid. And someone says, well, there's no scientific evidence that heading a soccer ball is bad for you. And I would say, well, it prevents in midair collisions or, 
it could be bad, or it's not necessary to pursue the sport for 95, 98% of the kids that play. My approach would be that's more common sense and maybe less science. Uh, Stanley, I want to get in. Yeah, I assure you that all of us up here would certainly be completely lost without the science. Um, and we definitely, we're not trying to stoke fears. Um, we're not trying to stoke paranoia. I think, uh, as someone said, I think a lot of that sort of idea comes from people who think that there is some sort of war on football, some sort of conspiracy to take it down, which I'm not suggesting you were saying at all. Um, but I think especially with female concussions, there's you know, a lack of coverage in many ways. I mean, we're all covering it um, in some way or another, but uh, it, I mean, it stems from the fact that there's just a lack of coverage of women's sports generally. Um, so there's no coverage there. And then the sports that are getting coverage with, you know, when you think about concussion, you're thinking about most people, not maybe not the people in this room, but most people who are reading us are thinking about football and Will Smith, um, not, you know, soccer, lacrosse, water polo, et cetera. And these are the sports that both men and women are playing. We also, for a lot of journalists, sometimes, you know, too much knowledge is a dangerous thing um, where they think they know the science better than they do. I mean, the conventional scientific wisdom in the 1990s was that testosterone really wouldn't do much to enhance your performance. If you talk to a doctor, that's really what most of them would say at the time. But a good journalist was also talking to guys who were lifting Buicks and saying, no, actually, I think there might be <laughs> an upside to this. Because uh, they were not doing double-blind controlled studies. They were just jamming every drug they could think of into their bodies uh, and getting pretty good lab results uh, as a result of it. Uh, maybe not the cleanest. But so sometimes as a journalist, you do have to recognize the, you know, just you know, the, the importance of science, how limited the method can be to get accurate scientific results as opposed to what's going on in these worlds that we cover. Just like, sorry, just temper, going back to that thing what Emily said on the previous panel. Um, we all got into this, I presume, because we, we love sport. You know, we enjoyed whatever sport it is. For me, there's a real need to not scaremonger. And I think we, we do get accused of that quite a lot of the time, is that we, what's the end goal for us? To ban American football in your case, or certainly in my case, what's the end goal to ban rugby or something like that? Uh, it's not, because I think the end goal for me is for people to have informed choice, in that you know these sports have risks. This is one of the possible risks. And there's, like you said about the heading the football, you know, there's a whole different, we don't have time to get into it, you know, in terms of the, issues of when a child can make that decision and all that kind of stuff. But I, what I would like to say here is to echo what you said, it's, there's so many positives, so many positives. And, like, and, and also, you know, the, the, the want of an athlete, they spend their whole lives trying to do what they do. Every single one that I've interviewed who is retired or current, who's had concussions, retired because of the concussions, you say to them, 10 years time, you will not be able to remember anything you've done. Would you do it again? Not one person has said to me no yet. It's mm -hmm. always yes. Do you have other questions? Please. Um, I have a question. I take it further what you guys are all talking about. The, the oh. I'd like to take it further what everyone's talking about. And you've all made excellent points. And you talk about how important the research is. And I couldn't agree with you more. But I also think that you play a role in talking about what therapy is there to give this population and every population hope. Without hope, they're not gonna make it. And there's a lot out there and there's, I don't see very much written about that and that is to me equal of importance and weight, especially for the parents. And you're asking, how do you find out? An athlete's not gonna report. Find, get the permission, talk to their families. They'll give you a lot of information. I, just, I, I, Please. Think, I think actually on that score, the most important stories to do now to keep everybody learning are about athletes who become advocates themselves. Mm -hmm. and, and you've seen that all over this room. Um, athletes who have gone through the process of figuring out um, and, and often really painstakingly, often with a lot of blind alleys and dead ends, how to get better often then become the best communicators of stories because athletes listen to other athletes way more than they listen to journalists. Mm -hmm. And so stories about the athletes who become advocates are really important and powerful. I also think it's important for organizations, for, for medical institutions. I mean, I, I, I live in D.C. 
Um, I've been coaching soccer for 10 years. Um, the connections that a children's hospital can make with the local league, you know, you talk about making sure people know that there's therapy, making, the, making sure that they know that there's someone they can turn to. That shouldn't only be the media's job. I mean, that's incumbent on the athletic organizations to reach out to medical organizations and form a kind of alliance and to, to make sure that there are common sense rules and that there are procedures to contact people and to get that kind of information out. But yeah, sure, the, the media should do a better job of recognizing what the therapy is and, and doing those stories when they, when they present themselves. I mean, just to follow on to your point, I mean, one of the problems, one of the reasons it's hard to sometimes tell some of the stories, this is more sort of at the older professional level than necessarily the concussion management level among youth sports is, you know, in some of my dealings with like retired NFL players, for instance, um, they're on their own trying to figure this out, like literally searching the country and or the globe looking for like the right, again, the right expert in the right, very specialized area to deal with their very discreet type of brain damage. Um, there is no like clearinghouse. No one's helping. Their own union isn't helping them. Their league isn't helping them. They're, they're, they're basically cast off and just say, you know what? You made your money, figure it out. Via can deal, sorry. And that's, that's a big problem. And I don't know how you fix that, but I think telling those stories is also important. They're not hopeful stories yet, but they're the first step towards getting to stories where there might be some hope. We have time for one more. One sir. more question, and then after 9 o'clock, everybody can start talking about football. I, uh, I held everybody off all day long. And is there a bar everyone's going to? There's definitely a I lot more say, to be yeah, said. Please feel free to grab any of us afterward. And, uh, the, the Tombs, Marriott, make, the tombs, make, a, make a plan. Uh, Crowd. Old, Mar old Martins fans, that's another. But, uh, yeah, right. what, one, one more, please, and then we yeah. have to double the staff's pay. Uh -oh. oh, please. Oh, geez. check. Check, check. Okay. Oh, God. Go. All right. Now, uh, I'm really uh, honored to have the last question here tonight. But, uh, <laughs> behave, Matt. Behave. But uh, <laughs> in, 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 in all seriousness, let me, let me say um, that sport, my wife was a tremendous athlete. She was a college All American gymnast. I was a surgical project football player. And um, we came away with very grave reservations about the way sports are conducted. And this is 1980s. Um, for the record, my son didn't play football. I didn't want him to play football. I don't recommend that sport for an adult or a child. But that's my personal point, or my personal opinion. But on media, um, I did a study regarding uh, coverage of anabolic drugs in football uh, from 1983 to 1999. And all I can say for these people are they are in a whirlwind of pressure and uh, forces. Media is a business, folks. You've got to pay the light bill. And hard news doesn't pay the light bill. Investigative reporting doesn't do it. The mythology pays the light bill. The grandos, the great themes, the hero athletes, the coaching geniuses. And I'm not totally objecting to that because I've got a lot of respect for those people. But I want to ask you guys, especially as staff media people, daily media, how difficult is it <laughs> with your limited resources, even at ESPN? People don't realize that. They think there's some sort of big governing intellect out there that knows all. It's omnipresent. And these people, <laughs> how many hours did you work this week, TJ? I don't even want to think about it. Yeah, that. <laughs> yeah, for instance. And, and let me ask you this. Do you feel like you're on top of things? You're constantly. My personal life? No. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> professional. Let's keep it professional yeah, here. Okay. Okay. We'll keep it. Thank you. My daughter's sitting right there. Uh, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Uh, you never feel like if you're doing it right, you never feel like you're on top of it. Exactly. So you guys comment as being especially full-time staff daily media. How difficult is it to deal with especially medical and scientific issues? Sometimes you're assigned at one o'clock in the afternoon and you gotta have a story at five o'clock. 
This is an extremely difficult kind of topic to cover. We're talking about football. We're talking about concussions specifically in women. Um, we're talking about the intersection with sports, with public policy, with medicine. Um, it's very difficult because especially when you're talking about people who work in sports, journalism covering it a lot of times you're people that are used to covering baseball games, football games, basketball games, soccer games. And all of a sudden, you're in this crash course of all these other fields and also how they interact. That's the thing is that none of this, like the medicine and the science doesn't happen in a vacuum. What happens on the field, the policies your leagues have, that your teams have, that your coaches have, doesn't happen in a vacuum. What's happening with funding, not happening in a vacuum. The litigation front, which we haven't even talked about really at all, that shapes everything. That shapes things more than the media stories do. All of it interacts. And so if you really want to cover this story and cover it well, you sort of have to gain at least a working knowledge as a journalist of all of these fields. And that's difficult. And Matt's right. Our business is not as a whole as, I don't know if you guys read the papers that are left, but that's, the, that's our business, right? Like the media business isn't doing great as a whole. And so we're doing more with less all the time. Yet this is an extremely complex topic that takes people to really dedicate and throw themselves into full time the way we were describing TJ here. You gotta be working on this 24 seven. You really have to give yourself over to it. There are not a lot of people that have the luxury of doing that. But if you don't love it, you're not doing it to begin with, I think. True. I mean, I hope everybody in the room has something that they love to do irrationally beyond cost benefit analysis <laughs> as much as we love to cover this. You can't go to an editor and say, um, I want to spend two weeks of my time studying progesterone. Um, uh, they won't even, what, you know? Um, you have to do that at night and read scientific papers and find the sources and call the sources and show up and, and then maybe you find an idea that you can pitch that actually will sell as a story but also get across the important facts that underlie. Now, having said that, I've been doing this for 10 years and ESPN, which gets a lot of flack in some, some different, from some different quarters, has never stood in my way and editors who have found a story interesting have always found a way to do that story. So it's getting, it's hard and it's getting harder, but we all have things that we love to do in life that are hard and this is ours. I mean, is that? Yeah. That makes no, sense. No, I just the staff. Yeah, I, mean, I, I was warned that this was trouble to get all you guys on a stage, but I just, I just had this idea in my head. So I'm so happy for everybody. Um, we, Tom um, is doing a documentary with um, Sky Sports, and um, I honestly couldn't afford the monitor. It was, so we're going to send you a link when, when, he, when on email, check out Tom's documentary. When's it coming out? I think it's out in about two and a half weeks. I don't know if anyone's going to be able to watch it in this country, but if you, if you are, then I'll send it's it to you. It's a reason to go to London. Watch Tom's documentary. We'll, we'll pirate it with uh, Kanye's album. Yeah. Maybe. Any, anything else? Anything? I, Wait, Canada? Canada. Uh, I don't know. If, if anyone does get Sky Sports, then you'll be able to could, get it on that. Can uh, start and, a or you'll be able to get it by means that aren't, as long as the camera's not recording <laughs> that. So I'm, yeah. I'm sure Tom will be glad to email it to everyone individually. Uh, <laughs> With the you can record it and send us all videotapes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I want to thank everybody on the panelists. Thanks. The stage did not catch fire with this much energy on one thing. So really, really thank you. Um, I did ask five or six different female reporters to come, and they hadn't covered concussions and weren't comfortable. So we ended up with the people that write about concussions. So I was, exactly. Andrea Kramer had a, 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 something with her son tonight. So I want to thank everybody that came up here. Thank everyone that came today. It's a 13-hour event. We're only one hour and five minutes over. Uh, I uh, think Georgetown. Well, it's supposed to be over to eight. Eight. No, eight, eight. I'm good. I'm good. Um, Georgetown, US Lacrosse, um, my family, my friends, um, my interns, um, Dave Miltzman, um, uh, Mark Burns, and um, thank you, uh, donors. Oh, uh, Dorothy Bedford. Sorry, sorry. I had that in my came up. I, um, and. Um, uh, Derek Howard, um, I think, uh, oh, um, the football player, oh, I just forgot, 
a really great, really wonderful dad football player. I've just spaced his name. I got in a bad car accident. I got a four-car pile up on Tuesday, so I'm still trying to sort that out. Um, great football player. I email his name out, and he's got two young daughters, and he just sent us a check out of the blue. So really thank you, and thank you for hanging in there. Um, yes, Tony. Tony. We won't tell Tony I spaced his name, but um, Tony's very wonderful. So thank you all, for, and um, we're going to meet t tomorrow at the med school. I'll send out an email from 9 to 11. You're out at 11, and we're just going to start writing the paper. So hopefully we'll have a paper out in a couple months. Thank you.